chemistry plays a vital role in helping to solve the biggest challenges facing our nation, and chemical manufacturing is an important part of the U.S. economy. More than half a million Americans, very possibly some of your friends, family, and neighbors, work directly in chemical manufacturing. These workers are dedicated to keeping each other safe and protecting the communities where they live and work. Chemistry is all around us, but most people don't fully appreciate its connection and importance to our daily lives or the great care and effort that goes into manufacturing chemicals. It's easy to overlook, since most people are removed from it, but make no mistake that the nation depends on the chemical sector. Safe drinking water, plentiful food supply, abundant energy, and life-saving medicines, these essential products are vital to the things we need every day. In fact, more than 96% of all manufactured goods are directly touched by the business of chemistry which is why the federal government considers the U.S. chemical sector a critical part of our country's infrastructure. Chemical manufacturing is based on the basic elements of chemistry that we learned in high school, just in a more diverse, sophisticated manner. Just about every scientific discipline is put to work to harness the transformative power of chemistry by combining raw materials such as natural gas and oil with heat, air, and water through a variety of processes to make basic building block chemicals. Chemical plant operations can be highly specialized and use a wide array of technologies to carefully control processes used to manufacture chemicals. Plants come in many shapes and sizes depending on what the facility produces. Chemical manufacturing essentially comes down to reconfiguring, moving, and managing molecules to make chemical compounds that are used to sustain our modern life. Most chemical plants involve the reaction between two or more materials, or molecules, which is controlled in a vessel called a reactor to create a new material. The final result flows from the reactor, where the desired product is separated from side substances and is then purified and concentrated. Let's take a closer look at the anatomy of a chemical plant to see how it works. Piping. One thing you will notice when you visit a facility is that there are numerous racks of pipes of various sizes, which are used to feed the chemical process with raw materials and move finished product to storage tanks. The contents can at times be moving through pipes under high pressure and or at high temperatures. Manufacturing units. Manufacturing units are the business end of a plant and where all the real action takes place. This chemical process is often done using specially built equipment called crackers, which is a special type of reactor where heat or a catalyst is used to transform a single molecule, like ethane or propane, into a different and more useful product, like ethylene or propylene. In addition to reaction vessels, each unit is a collection of distillation columns, pipes, pumps, compressors, and equipment specifically designed for the chemistry being produced. Units are designed and constructed to safely manage heat, pressure, and the flow of liquids and other elements involved in the chemical manufacturing process. Control Room Numerous sensors, valves, and other instruments control equipment throughout the plant are used to closely monitor and manage the reaction and movement of materials throughout the plant. Operators, often in a centrally located control room with large display panels, monitor the activity in the manufacturing units and other important equipment. These workers can make adjustments to help safely control and manage operations. Storage. Raw materials and finished product are stored throughout the facility, frequently in above-ground storage tanks. Depending on the contents, a variety of safety features may be incorporated into the tanks, from floating roofs and suppression systems to prevent the buildup of flammable concentrations of vapors, to diking and levee systems that help prevent chemicals from escaping the facility. Distribution Shipments of materials typically flow in and out of chemical plants on a regular basis to support the manufacturing process. Special areas may be constructed within the plant, including docks and rail yards, to handle the safe loading and unloading of raw materials and finished products. These chemical products are distributed through a network of storage and distribution facilities that warehouse and repackage chemicals for a broad array of customers. From here, they are transported to farms and factories all across the country and the world to create the essential items people need and use every day. The potential risks associated with chemical manufacturing are well documented. 
which is why companies often go to great lengths and put a great deal of focus on preventing incidents from occurring in the first place. To help prevent incidents, operators rely on a deliberate and well-established method developed by chemical engineers called process safety, which is used to help manage the flow of energy and control hazards such as excess heat and pressure. Companies use process safety to examine the steps in the manufacturing process to identify opportunities to prevent incidents. As we have learned from past accidents, when an incident does occur, it may be caused by procedural error or equipment failure, among other things. These are the problems that process safety was created to prevent. It starts with carefully designing and constructing facilities. It also involves employing clear and comprehensive procedures to help keep operations within prescribed safety limits. And it typically includes a regular and thorough maintenance schedule to maintain equipment integrity. A process safety event, or an incident, typically occurs when there is a loss of containment resulting in the release of materials from the system. To help prevent incidents like these, a facility on occasion will use a process called flaring to prevent overpressurizing equipment, which could lead to an uncontrolled release. Flaring is a carefully engineered safeguard and is done with the permission of state and federal regulatory authorities. Another important area of focus involves the use of operating procedures to manage the hazards associated with shutting down and restarting a chemical facility. Stopping and starting a plant can be a complicated and hazardous process that must be done carefully to ensure the safety of employees and minimize emissions. That is why it is important for workers to be familiar with operating manuals specific to the plant and to follow them closely. These manuals provide guidance on when to shut down, how to do so, and whether to fully or partially shut down. These procedures are required to be annually certified by plant management. Even when companies go to great lengths to prevent incidents, accidents can and do still happen. That's why it's so important for companies to have comprehensive emergency response plans in place to help get things under control quickly and minimize any impact on workers, neighbors, and the environment. When it comes to planning for a potential emergency, safety is no accident. It is normally the result of careful planning, continuous training, and regular drills. Industry programs, such as the American Chemistry Council's Responsible Care Program, provide useful guidance for companies when it comes to safety and emergency planning. Additionally, several federal regulations, such as the Environmental Protection Agency's Risk Management Program and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's Process Safety Management Program, oversee various aspects of chemical plant safety and emergency planning. It is not unusual for some of the larger facilities to have their own emergency personnel and equipment on site, and they are often the first to respond. Depending on the severity and impact of the incident, companies may use a response that incorporates the following actions. Notify local officials and the public via a reverse 911 system, electronic notification systems, social media, and media reports to share important health and safety information. Set up a joint information center to coordinate response efforts with local emergency responders, neighboring facilities, government agencies, and other stakeholders. Work closely with local, state, and federal officials to perform additional air and water quality monitoring. Activate additional response and firefighting capabilities from neighboring facilities if needed via mutual aid agreements. Perform an emergency shutdown of equipment. Relocate chemicals relieve excess pressure by flaring gases, or take other steps to prevent an incident from escalating. While facility shutdowns and startups can be an important part of an emergency response plan, it's important to note that due to their complex nature and the potential hazards involved, they must be well thought out and performed carefully. Forcing a facility to shut down unexpectedly at the last minute can result in a large increase of emissions and serious damage to equipment. An unplanned shutdown can also greatly increase the risk of a major incident. Of course, a large-scale shutdown of multiple processes and facilities will amplify these consequences. To be done safely, shutdown and startup procedures should take place over weeks with ample advance notice. This is true even during emergency situations, which is why companies try to give facility personnel as much time as possible to shut down operations if it becomes absolutely necessary. 
As they work to bring a situation under control, facility operators usually collaborate closely with local emergency departments and officials throughout an incident to try to help keep their neighbors and the public well informed. In some cases, out of abundance of caution, nearby residents might be asked to shelter in place or evacuate until a significantly hazardous situation has been brought under control. Safety never rests. Companies are continuously looking for ways to improve their safety performance by tracking performance metrics and analyzing safety trends. The industry also applies learnings from past incidents, including the results and recommendations from investigations conducted by the Chemical Safety Board. Companies also work closely with their communities through local emergency planning committees and community advisory panels to discuss and address safety concerns. They also cooperate with policymakers and regulators at all levels to help safeguard the public and environment. One of the best ways to get a greater understanding of chemical operations in your community is to arrange a visit to a nearby facility for a tour. You can learn firsthand from the people who work there about what they make, their connection to the community, and how they work together to address safety.